the title of our um, message today is Heavenly Arsenal. And um, as you can tell from the theme, we're, it's really talking about spiritual warfare. So let us pray. Father God, not my words, but your words. Certainly not my thoughts, but your thoughts, dear God. Speak through me to your people. Let the words that I say so seize in their hearts, minds, bodies, souls, and spirits, dear God, so that they can build much fruit for the kingdom of God and, and advance the kingdom of God on earth today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, we're going to go to a familiar scripture to most of you. The scripture is Ephesians 6, <clears throat> verses 10 through 18. Most of us call that scripture the army of the the army of God. So if you have your Bibles, grab your Bibles. And I'm going to read the scripture. I asked you to um, make sure you had your Bibles and your markers so you can mark in your Bible. It's always good to mark in your Bible, write in your Bible. Bibles are not supposed to be kept clean. They're supposed to be used. <laughs> so um, let's start with <clears throat> verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord in his might and his power. Put on the full, full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Notice he didn't say get half dressed. He said get full dressed, fully dressed. And notice that he said you need to be able to stand against the devil's tricks because the devil has many tricks. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Look at all of the things you're fighting against. That's a lot. Therefore, put on the what? full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, notice how many times in your Bible, underline the word stand. Notice how many times he says stand. Stand your, your ground. After you have done everything to do what? Just stand. And then he comes back again. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes with the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up your shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, which means the evil, arrow, the, the evil one is always throwing something at you. 17, take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Notice that in all of that, you only have one weapon. He tells you to stand and he tells you, take up the sword, which is the word. So this soldier only had one weapon. And then the final verse, verse 18, and and pray in the spirit on all occasions. Pray in the spirit. That means use your prayer language. On all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests, with this in mind, be alert, which means don't be asleep. Pay attention. And always keep on praying for how many of God's people? all God's people, not just your family, not just your church, not just your friends. You pray for all other Christians. Amen. <clears throat> okay. I figured out a couple of things. One of them is that this is going to be um, a two-part sermon because I, when he woke me up at six o'clock this morning, he was still giving me parts of the sermon. I'm saying, God, I can't do all this in 30 minutes. So it's going to be a two-part sermon. So we're going to get through as much as we can today. Uh, 
we have been trained in our culture, and I've said this to you all many times, that um, we think the world is a playground, and we have become notorious for that in our country. We think the world is a playground. Everything, many things in our culture is centered around sports. Sports are just games. As I was sharing with my friend last night, we're learning to reprioritize. I said, I said, how did you, did you ever think you could get through a season without basketball, a whole basketball season? Some people think, you know, whether they team win or lose, it's a matter of life and death. So we don't have sports anymore. The entertainment has been minimized. All of your options to go out and party and have fun and all of that has been taken away. And so people are really wrestling because they think their whole world is about entertainment, that this is a playground. When my children were little, they would come to me and they would say, mom, I'm bored. As if I was the uh, recreation director for the house. I was supposed to keep them entertained. And I would say to them, who owns that problem? I certainly don't because I'm not bored. And they would look at me like I'm crazy, like they used to always do, because I would say crazy things like that to them. And I said, you own the problem, you figure out a way to entertain yourself. That's not my job. But right now we have children who think they're supposed to be entertained 24 seven. And now we brought them up that way. And now they're home with their parents and their parents are going crazy. So we have to be careful about expectations that we set with other people. It's been a very difficult time in quarantine. Domestic violence has gone up because people are, are, are freaking out with their, the, their spouses. People are freaking out with the children. The, the police officer had to go on on the, lo on the local uh, mayor's update a couple of weeks ago and said, teaching them how to de-escalate family violence from being in quarantine is that when you get in an argument, step away, make some space, go outside you know, don't escalate the situation. He was giving them de-escalation strategies for the home because people want everything to be the way they want things to be. And now they're not in control of what, how things are. And they feel very uncomfortable with that. We also have people using unhealthy coping skills with quarantine. Alcoholism, way up. Alcohol consumption, way up. The liquor stores were considered an essential service. So they're still open. Marijuana consumption is way up. People are getting high and just zoning out. Depression, anxiety, worry, all of those things are, have been escalated. Insomnia escalated. Sleep, sleeping medicine people are taking because people are just stressing out because they have a new normal and it's not very comfortable. So the enemy is having a ball. He's wreaking havoc in people's lives right now. You have the party animals who said, I'm going to have a party. I don't care what they say about the quarantine. I'm going to have a party because they feel like partying is a right and it's more important than people's health. And that's sad. The football player, Zach Prescott, threw a party and had to be called in by management to explain to him why having a party under the quarantine was not appropriate. But there's the other side to this. We have a shakening and an awakening that's going on and it's happening all around the world. People are beginning to rethink their priorities. They're beginning to think what's really important. Is sports the end all and the be all of my existence? I can't just hang out in my man cave and watch sports all the time. There's more to life than that. They're rediscovering the value of simple things in life, the love of family and friends, reconnecting with God. They're learning not to prioritize work over loved ones. And I read this article, which was a very good article about we have to learn in this culture to stay home when we're sick and not go to work sick. That's why you have sick days. And we've been notorious for promoting the culture and people, the workers, to go to work sick. When I was a director, I would not, if my employees came in and I saw they weren't feeling well, I would send them home immediately because the workplace is not a place for sick people. You're supposed to be home. We're recognizing that busyness is a trick of the enemy. The Lord said to me when this quarantine first started, he said, Lily, the homes have become a transportation depot. He said, people rush into their homes to eat, they rush in their homes to sleep, and they rush out for everything else. 
And he said, even during dinner time, the families don't gather around the table to eat dinner. You have some in this room eating, some in this room eating, some in this room eating. Families have not come together as a unit to even have dinner time. And the altar being a table came from the fact that families were supposed to gather around the table, which is the altar to fellowship and eat, eat their own, eat dinner together. And, you know, and in our house, if you didn't come to the table to eat dinner, guess what? You didn't eat. It was just that simple. So we need to go back to some of the basics. And I think that it's, it's the shaking and the awakening. The, the, the media is telling us now there's going to be a new normal after this virus. And the new normal is not going to really, it's not going to be an overnight new normal. It's going to evolve by months and maybe even years as our lives start to gradually change because this virus has really shifted some things. On the other side of it, we have some good things that's going on too. Pollution has been reduced considerably because we're staying home. People in, um, that live near mountains say they can see mountains that they haven't seen in years because the smog has lifted. You don't have airplanes flying, polluting the skies, the air, and you don't have us driving cars. So smog level is down. The waters are, are, are clearing up. Venice can see blue water, which they haven't seen, and they, they don't know when. Um, the animals are coming out. Actually, they're coming out invading some things. The animals are coming out because we're in, because it was their natural habitat. And so the environment is changing, too. The earth, it's almost as if the earth is exhaling and inhaling and saying, Phew. because we have not been good stewards of our earth, of our planet. And so some good things are coming out of the, the, the quarantine also. And for me, you all know I'm hooked on hopium. I always look for the, the silver lining. And I'm excited about the praise reports that's going to come out of the, the testimony of people that, shouldn't have, that should have died from this virus that didn't die. Like I shared with you all the testimony about my father. With all of my father health challenges, there's no way in the world he should have left that hospital in three days better. He should have been like the other people who were dying every three minutes. And he was in one of the hospitals that was the epicenter of the virus. But, and I've been praising and thanking God ever since then because my mother has come through breast cancer last year and now my dad came through this coronavirus this year. So you can't tell me prayer didn't work. Prayer worked. And I think that after the virus happens and we are able to return to church, I think when we get back to church and worship, you know, they say you don't miss what you have till you lose it. So we'll be worshiping with, our pure, with pure hearts, a, a, a worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And I think with a new level of passion and fervor, because now we understand the value of fellowship. We understand the value of gathering, collective gathering and being and standing on one accord and worshiping the Lord. And I know that many people who have not gone to church before, because the thing about the virus is, it's beyond everyone's control. And if you have any knowledge, you, you understand that anything that's beyond man's control is never beyond God's control. And people are, are understanding for the first time in their lives that God is in control. God is truly sovereign. The, the rich people are learning. This is something I can't buy my way out of. The powerful people are learning. This is something I can't strategize our way of, out of. So they're realizing that this virus is totally beyond everyone's control. The medical and scientists, the medical teams and the scientists, they have no idea why one per patient recovers like my dad and another patient who had less health challenges than my dad dies. They still can't figure it out. And the Lord said to me one day, they won't be able to figure it out because I'm determining who lives and who dies. So it, it, it's a difficult situation. And we all realize right now that we're in the midst of global spiritual warfare. This is just not a US problem. This problem is all over the world. And I, 
he wanted me to talk to you all about spiritual warfare today because we're in a battle, a spiritual battle like we have never been in before. And we have more weapons than just prayer to fight this battle with. He's given us several weapons to fight this battle with. God is moving the church back to what he originally called us to be. Um, I think I have in your sermon notes, ecclesia is a Greek word, which means church, and it really means to call out, to call people out, to form. So he calls us out of the world so that we can form our church. And, and the church, one of the things that made the church grow so fast in Acts 2 was the fact that the church prayed. We were a praying church. And um, I can guarantee you right now, I mean, I have heard, I have gotten so many invitations to prayer lines. I only participate in one, and the prayer line I participate in is Tuesday through Thursday night because that's the one prayer line God told me to participate in. So I'm only doing one. I know people that, that I know churches that have prayer lines every night. They have prayer conference calls every night of the week. The church is praying. I know people that are on two or three or four different prayer lines, and they're praying every night of the week because they realize that that we got to pray our way through this situation. But there's more things than we can do than just pray. And finally, for the introduction, I would like to say, and, and the Lord keeps telling me this, and he's been telling me this for the last three weeks, probably for the last month. And, and you need to repeat this. This time is personal. This time is personal. We need to get that in our spiritual DNA. And what he's saying to me, what he, was, what he said to me about that is, this time you need to personally come to me for yourself. You need to personally not rely on anybody else, not rely on the church to be praying for you, not to rely on your parents to be praying for you. This time, if you want to get through this situation and you want to come out on top, you need to personally come before me. You need to personally get on your knees and pray. You need to personally talk to me. You need to personally connect with me. You need to pers personally worship me. So remember, this time he's saying it's personal. I'm going to talk about the three dimensions of, uh, of our heavenly arsenal. He gave it to me in dimensions. And the first dimension, and the slide is on the screen, the first dimension, and you have it in your notes, is the ecclesia. It's, it's the church that's been called into service. We have been called out of the world into the kingdom of God. And when you enter the kingdom of God, we have to be trained on how the kingdom of God operates. And that's why I, I, when, when I did the sermon series on the Beatitudes, I said, this is how you become a, a kingdom citizen. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are those who are persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of God. You become a kingdom citizen. You're called in, um, in Ephesians 1, verses 17 through 19. There's a scripture reference for the calling. And then in Galatians is how Paul was called. You're called individually. You're called out. You're singled out to come into the church. And we use, and I'm using this, the military metaphor, because the same thing happens in the military. Uh, the people, the, the military goes out to the schools and they recruit people. They have to bring in recruits into the military. We don't draft anymore like we did during the Vietnam time. All the military, the military is volunteers. So you got to get volunteers to come into the military. And as soon as you get into the military, they send you into boot camp and they train you. And uh, Reverend Fleck and, and, and uh, who I'm, 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 I'm re getting ready to say, <laughs> Uncle Dad, I need to say Clarence. I never heard that term until this morning. But Uncle <laughs> Clarence, you all can correct me. You all know you can nod your head if I got it right. But when you go into boot camp, it's tough, it's training. And they got to change. You got to thank you. You're giving me a fist bump. Because you you have to unlearn a whole bunch of things and relearn other things. And that's what you have your sergeants for, to teach you how to do that. Well, the same thing is supposed to happen in church. When we come into church, we have to unlearn some stuff. We have to unlearn the worldly, worldly ways. And we have to relearn God ways. And the church is supposed to equip us. 
It's supposed to equip us with the word so that we can learn the word of God and we can learn how to apply the word of God in our lives. The church is supposed to learn how to correct us so we can start feeling uncomfortable using profanity. My, my daughter uh, told me, oh, mama, you need to watch this new movie. It's called Uncork. And, 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 and she, so I said, okay, I went on Netflix. I turned the movie on. I couldn't watch the movie. I got through about three, four, five minutes of the movie. Profanity in the music, profanity in the language, profanity. I just, my spirit was like, ah! So, but we have to unlearn because that's the norm in society. But once you come into the kingdom, profanity is not an option for you. You start learning not to curse and not even wanting to use profanity. And we have to learn that everything we do is not right. When we make bad choices, there are consequences. And when we make bad choices, we have to confess and we have to ask God for forgiveness and we have to repent. The, the national prayer call that I participate on, we have intercessors that lead the prayer calls, different ones every night. And one of the things God keeps telling them, because these are prophetic intercessors that are coming on, God has called, we have prayed repentance once a week, every week since we started. We've had to stand in the gap and repent for this country. We've had to stand in the gap and repent for the church and for believers, just confess and repent all of the horrible things that we have done calling ourselves Christians calling ourselves believers. And one of the things that I'm noticing is that we have taken, and then the Lord said this to me, we have taken confession and repentance out of the church. When the last time you heard anybody preach a sermon on confessing and repenting? And I'm, I, we have been listening to teaching on confessing and repenting every week for the last month or so. But we don't even talk about confessing and repentance anymore but once you confess and repent you because once you're enlightened that's when you confess and repent mm. thank you holy spirit but if you're only going to hear sermons that tickle your ears about love and joy and peace you're not going to be enlightened to your own sins you're going to walk around in self-righteousness and you're not going to confess and repent when you lie and you chill and you speak uh, you, you cheat and you misuse people and use profanity and do all of the things in, in, in Galatians 19 that we don't talk about, you're not going to do that because you're not going to feel convicted about doing any of those things. But if, if you, once you become enlightened, you're transformed. And, and we don't have transformation testimonies. You're transformed. We used to hear this when we were in church. Things I used to do, I don't do no more. Things like what, Pastor Lily? Lie, cheat, steal. Places I used to go, I don't go no more. I used to wonder what places that they used to go. I was a little girl. I used to hear people say that and sing that. I said, where did they used to go that they don't go in no more? To the bars, to the crack houses, to the bordellos. That's what they were talking about. Things I used to say, I don't say anymore. Using profanity speaking curses over people. We have those transformation testimonies. And that was, that was, these things are supposed to be core to the foundation of any church. And then once you get your testimony and you have really been enlightened, then they teach you the rules of engagement. If you're going to fight an enemy, you're supposed to learn as much as you can about the enemy. And how do you do that? You go to your word. And the word tells you what the enemy does. And you know what that is. The enemy, he, he uses deception. He uses division. He uses distraction. He uses denial. All of those deeds, I've given those to you. And you, then once you understand how the enemy works, you are sent into battle. And then he told me to add the fact that when you go into battle, you go into battle, you have to use your common sense. And common sense means you don't test or tempt God. Satan told Jesus, throw yourself off the mountain. You know the angels will come pick you up and catch you before you fall. And Jesus said, you don't tempt God. It's, it's right in the Bible. Now, does Jesus say you don't tempt God? What well, we look like tempting God and testing God. And you also learn the common sense on the first dimension is that 
obedience is better than sacrifice. You can sacrifice and go to church every day. But if you disobey everything God tells you to do, he'll say, get behind me. I know you're not. Amen. So now we can move on to the second level. I gave you some, um, but when the church was operating like that, back to what I'm saying, go back to the original church, the church grew. It grew like wildfire and it spread it. <clears throat> the second dimension is prayer warriors. First you were called, then you were trained. You were trained to become prayer warriors. And you know, I like to say you're praying, we're, we're prayer warriors, not prayer wimps. So now you got, using a military metaphor, you got your Air Force, your Army, your military, uh, your, your Navy, your Marines, they're ready for battle. Then you got your hierarchy, you know, you got your colonels and your lieutenants and your generals and all of that up. And then, and then I, I added Lions of Judah because that's who we are. We're, we are lions in this, on the battlefield. We're lions. We're supposed to roar. We're supposed to fight. We're not supposed to be scared in the kingdom. But our goal is to go up the pyramid to the top. And so we start with the base. The base is, and, and I know we have been taught this and taught this and taught this, praise your way through. Praise will do this and praise will do that. Praise is the lowest level of battle warfare, of spiritual warfare. Guess what? Anybody can praise. When we watched the video yesterday, Christian went up, looked up, and saw the saw the, the the youth dancing. He went up, he started praising. And when people come to the church the first time, they can always get their dance on. They can always get a praise going. Praise is the lowest level of spiritual warfare, and you have to remember that. Praise will help you win the battle, but it's not the only weapon you need to win the battle. You need to move up to the next level. The next level is prayer. We have to pray his word. And Jesus said in John 17, he said, sanctify them with your truth. I have given them my word to sanctify them. The word of God is powerful. And I've told you all so many times, your words have power. God's words have more power. So when you invoke God's word in your prayer, you have power. That's why God has given me Psalms for you to pray over your family every week to perfect to protect your family and i hope you're praying those psalms you really need to pray them every day over your household Mitty got her praise report she doesn't have the virus we're covered you have to you cover your household you cover your family you cover your doorpost you keep your you do what god tells you to do obedience is better than sacrifice then that's how you protect your family and then the next level up in the second dimension, the final level is faith. Notice how Paul just keeps saying, stand in that passage. Stand firm in your faith. Stand. Don't, you don't have to fight. If you armor up and you put on the word of God and you use the word of God and you work the word of God, all you got to do is just stand and God will take care of the rest. Um. A lot of us have learned to fight spiritual warfare on this battle. We learn how to pray. We learn how to uh, praise. We learn how to use our faith. But when you get to the next level, and I'm going to give you a couple examples. When you get to the next level of warfare, this is where it gets really interesting. But let me tell you a couple of things about um, this level. I think I'm going to talk about this. When I said you need to learn your enemy's strategy, you need to know how the enemy work. And one of the things I learned, uh, Graham Cook said this, and it's so true. Intimidation and fear are the biggest weapons that the enemy uses. If he can get you intimidated or scared about anything, he immobilizes you, he paralyzes you, you freeze and, you, and you're not effective. And so, and, and the enemy uses fear and intimidation because they're cheap. They don't cost them. And he doesn't have the riches and the resources that God has. So he, he's very effective at playing on our fears and our, our inferiorities and our insecurities. He, he, he thrives on using those. And then that's his first level of attack. The second level of attack 
he will attack our body with ailments so he can delay or deny us from doing things that God wants us to do. And then as he moves up, he starts using deception and distractions and, and he tries to divide. And once he gets you immobilized and once he gets you hurting, then he can tell you you're going to die from the virus because now he's intimidating you again and you believe him. So he plays, the battlefield is always in the mind. But when the battlefield is in the mind, God has given us the word. And if you notice, I said that the, in the arm of God, you only have one weapon, the sword, the sword, which is the word of God. And so when you know that you, you sense that you're under attack by the enemy, we have to work the word. And how do you work the word? You start quoting scriptures. So when the enemy says, uh, he tells you something that you're afraid and, and it, 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 it makes you feel afraid every time you get a, your throat may seem like it's feeling a little sore and you say, oh God, I may have the virus. That's when you say, God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound, sound mind. You work the word. Jesus said, if you have faith, the size of a, must, a, a mustard seed, you can say to the mountain, speak to the mountain and the mountain will be moved. Jesus wasn't talking about a real mountain. Remember I told you he talked in metaphors and allegories and pictures. What he was talking about was whatever the mountain is that seems immovable in your life, you can speak to that thing and put the power of my word on it and you can use it. What kind of mountains, Pastor Lily? Depression. Oh, I'm so sad. I can't go nowhere. I'm all alone. I'm lonely. Then you speak to it. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Jesus said he would never leave me or forsake me. He will be with me always. So Jesus, I know you're here. I'm never alone because I'm, you, I'm with you. You can speak. You can say, if you're feeling weak, you can speak. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I can do all things who strengthens Christ. So you learn to speak the opposite of what the enemy is sending your way. Um, that's what, and, and you also learn that the, the battle that we're fighting, Paul told us, it's not against flesh and blood, it's with spirits and, and, and principalities, powers and rulers and authorities in the air. What he's saying is it's in the spiritual realm. We live in the natural realm. Remember I said we're spiritual beings living in a natural body. We live in the natural realm. But there are things that go on in the spiritual realm that impacts us. And we have to know how sometimes you've got to step up in the spiritual realm to fight something in the spiritual realm. And how do you do that? You fight it with the word. David did that when he went to fight Goliath. He said to Goliath, and I love that story, and I think it's 2 Samuel 17, when he says, you come at me with a sword and a spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. When David evoked the name of God. He brought God down from heaven into the battle. He brought the angelic host in to give him precision and skill and power to sling that one rock in the one place that would knock Goliath down. He took it from the natural realm and fought the battle in the spiritual realm. So we have to learn to be wise and fight using different and fight on the spiritual realm to beat our, our spiritual enemies. Now in the third dimension, and this is dimension, this is why I, I just sent the prayer host an email last night and I said to the prayer host, the weekly prayer calls have really blessed me. They have kept me inspired. They have kept me focused. They have kept me grounded. It's, um, it's been really a joy. And it's a joy for, I'll be in my prayer time on Monday morning and Tuesday morning and Wednesday and, and then, then Tuesday night, whatever the Lord showed me Monday or Tuesday, the host would say Tuesday night. Remember, oh, okay. Remember I told you God is not schizophrenic. He's not going to tell one prophet this thing and another prophet something totally different. God doesn't operate that way. But I did share with you all their frequency. There's a God frequency level of, of, of the prophetic stream. And if you're on the same prophetic stream, stream, you're going to hear 
the same thing. And a, a way to another way he gave it to me this morning to explain it to you is you got your FM radio and you got your AM radio, right? FM radio is the father's message. AM radio is your adversary's message. So we false prophets listen to the adversary. True prophets listen to FM, the father's message. And so when, when you hear something from the father's message, you will hear the same thing spoke, not something totally different. So on the third dimension, you have prophetic, and, and then that's the beautiful part about this call. You have prophetic intercessors on this call. They're not just praying. They're listening to what God is saying, and they're praying what he's telling them to pray and implementing it here on earth. And that's what makes it so powerful. And so, um, but in this, on this level, you start with worship. We start every prayer call with worship. We have to connect with God. And, and, the, and if you notice, praise is at the base of the foundation in, in the second dimension. Worship is at the base of the foundation in the third dimension. Worship is different than praise. And I've already done a sermon series on that. But in praise, you have intimacy with God. It's a one-on-one. -on -one. It's that praise is corporate. Worship is individual. So when you get into worship, that's when you start fellowshipping with God on a different way. And I love worship because when I go into worship, and I, I encourage you all to, to set some type of time apart, if not daily, at least once a week or twice a week, where you just put on your worship music and just hang out with the Lord. I like to do it late at night, and I, I don't know why I do it at night, because then I'm up half the night worshiping, because the herd and spirit get all like, wired up, and, 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 and it's, it's hard for me to go to sleep afterwards, because I have such a good time hanging out in the throne room with God. But when you worship, for me, when I worship, God whispers what I call sweet nothing in my ear. He starts just dropping rhema and revelation when I'm in the spirit of worship. And, and you have the scriptures there in John 4, 24, where Jesus told, told the Samaritan woman, God is a spirit. And, and he's looking for worshipers. And he's looking for worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. And how I interpret that is when you worship God and you hit a realm, your spirit and his spirit connect. And when your spirit and his spirit becomes one and that we, we're together, then he starts dropping truth. He starts dropping rhema on you and letting you and tell you things, telling you the secrets of the kingdom. So worship is the first level. And then after worship, we go up to rhema. That's when the rhema comes. And, and the rhema is the wisdom that he gives us. It's the divine uh, downloads that he starts giving, giving us. Like this morning, he said to me, he said, Lily, boot camp, BC. That's what the church is supposed to be. But the church is no longer a boot camp for, for training my, 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 my children. The church has become a boutique country club. Think about that. Think about the difference between a boot camp and a boutique country club. That's what God is saying about the church. It's a place where people go in, you choose the kind of brand of church you want. Do you want a church that talks about love, peace, and joy? Or do you want the church to focus on performing arts? Or do you want the church that focuses on um, uh, Christian rock music? Or do you want the church to focus on hymns? It's a boutique. You choose the kind of church you want to worship. And then country club. Country club, people of like minds doing the same thing. And you don't want anything different in the church because you all, all have a culture that you, you created. So he'll say, start dropping things like that in your spirit and you go, wow, God, that's deep. So then that's the next level. But, and then when you get up to the third level, if you can get, mm, if you get through the worship, if you get into the throne room, you start hanging out with the Lord and he starts dropping rhema on you, then you activate the angels. And the angels come in, your ministering angels, your guardian angels, your warring angels, your messaging angels, your protecting angels. That's when God starts sending his angels out, Jehovah Savio, the Lord of hosts. He sends his angels out 
to fight your battle, and the battle is not yours. The battle is the Lord's. He took me to second to, you know, when he was dropping Ramah on me on this, he took me to, Jeho to um, King Jehoshaphat in, in Second Chronicles 20. And all six of these things that I've shown you in levels two and three happened in, in, in Second Chronicles 20. You can pull out all six of those words in um, Second Chronicles 20. But let me give you a couple examples of what happened to me personally in terms of spiritual warfare. I had, um, I'll tell you what happened last week. For the last three weeks, whenever I get ready to record the sermon, I'll do my reading, I'll do my writing, and I start going through the sermon to get it in my spirit. And then whenever I make up in my mind the day that I'm going to record the sermon, when I wake up, the enemy hits me. Last Sunday was the, last Friday was the hardest that I had, well, the, the week before, that's why Joe got the sermon real hard. That was another battle with the enemy. But last Friday, I said, I'm going to re record the sermon. So I'm ready to record. I get up, and when I wake up, I woke up tired. I didn't, I didn't go to bed late. I didn't have a sleepless night. I woke up exhausted. So I get up, I go take the shower, and when I come out of the shower, I'm so weak, I walk back into the bedroom, I just fall across the bed. I say, I'll just lay here for five minutes to get my legs back. And then I'll go downstairs and start setting up for the sermon. I got to get dressed. I start thinking of everything I needed to do. And I laid across the bed. I woke up two hours later. When I woke up two hours later, I said, God, I know the enemy is coming after me. I know he doesn't want me to do the sermon. I've been fighting him all week because it's been the battle between you and him about what I write and what about that. So I said, I need help. And the Holy Spirit said to me, work the word. I said, oh. So I sat up on the bed and I said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Every time I would say that, energy would come into my body. Energy would come into my body every time I was said. It was like I was powering up. I wasn't using monster or bull or anything else. I was using God's word. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And then by the time I'm shouting, I'm all pumped up. I go in, get dressed, put on my war paint, come downstairs, and I start doing the sermon. Same thing happened this morning. I woke up this morning, six o'clock. Bam. Worst stomach cramps I ever had. I haven't had stomach cramps and I don't know when. My stomach just cramping. Just cramping. So, and I'm listening to all of the rumbling in my stomach. And I'm thinking, what did I eat? What happened? And then I realized the same thing. It's just spiritual warfare. Lily, get a girl. And so I said, I didn't even, and I, and I said, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Rapha, you got this. I'm going to take a shower anyway. I got to get dressed and put on all this camouflage stuff. I just went in, took a shower, came out, stomach stopped rumbling, bam, gone. Just like that. So I'm not, when, when I give you these messages like this, these downloads like this, I'm not telling you what I heard. I'm not telling you what I read. I'm telling you what I have experienced. So God wants us to work his word. He wants us to believe that if we position ourselves, if we take up our, put on the full armor of God, if we take up the word and work the word, all we have to do is just stand because the battle is not ours. Then the battle becomes the Lord and that's who we want to fight our battle. When, when he gave Josilia uh, the word about anoint your doorpost, for those of you who obey, you can you abide in the shadow of the most high God. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Do what God tells us to do. Put on your armor. Know that you're fighting. Don't be a prayer wimp. Be a prayer warrior. Read your Bible. Learn some scriptures. And when God gives you a scripture, if he starts bringing a scripture to your mind, quote it every day. You're covering yourself with the word. We're so used to covering ourselves with the blood, which is good. But you need the word also. You need prayer. You need faith. You need word.
worship. You need all six of those things. Don't just use one of them. Use them all. Amen? This is the word of the Lord. Amen.